Greetings all, Mark Boswell, Boswell Emergency Medical. I'm doing another video short today related to one of our recent CEN practice questions. This one will be in response to practice question 670, number 670. I believe it was posted on Friday the 21st. Remember, you can always go back through the Facebook page and scroll through and see all the previous questions. Um, again, we're up to question 670, so that's a free resource for you if you want to copy and paste those questions and answers and make them part of your personal study guide or whatnot as you prepare for the CEM. So practice question 670, um, I did want to spend a few minutes talking about it because there was a few good points brought up in the comments about the question and about the answer. So I want to talk to you about that. So question 670, it's the question asks or states that you are preparing a trauma patient for transfer by helicopter EMS to a tertiary facility. So this is a transfer patient and you're involved in getting them ready to go. It asks you what intervention needs to be done. And your choices were, I'm gonna look at my note here. Your choices were A, to discontinue the chest tube drainage unit and then clamp the chest tube. Choice B was to change the hair traction to a rigid knee immobilizer, is presumed they have a femur fracture. Answer C was to deflate the ET cuff on the endotracheal tube and reinflate it with saline. Answer D was to discontinue the intraosseous infusion and start a routine regular peripheral IV site. Okay. The correct answer will state. I'll state that first, then I'll talk about it. The correct answer is B. I'm sorry. The correct answer is C. Charlie to deflate the ET cuff and then to reinflate it with saline. So let's talk about the rationale and what makes this correct. So of course this question does start to touch upon some aviation medicine, things that may be a little more relevant for the flight nurse community or the flight paramedic community. You know, why is it relevant for the emergency nursing community? Well, this the concept behind this question is no great crazy technical thing and it's not really in-depth in aviation medicine it's just some basic concepts and it all revolves around uh, Boyle's law B-O-Y-L-E-S uh, law of expansion of gases at altitude and for those in the flight medicine community you should be familiar with these laws Charles law Boyle's law um, Henry's law Dalton's law and these all have to do with gas at altitude temperature um, etc. So this question is about Henry's Law and it's just a basic entry level information point and the knowledge here is the knowledge that you know or hopefully you know that as gas, as a container filled with gas goes to a higher altitude it's going to expand and put more pressure inside, I'm sorry not more pressure but it's going to expand the volume. Okay, So what's going to happen here is the ET cuff, uh, the notricular tube cuff normally is filled with air when we intubate somebody and if we're flying at altitude unpressurized I'll get back to that in a second unpressurized at altitude for every thousand feet you go up there's an increase in the pressure or the volume I'm sorry the volume of that gas and you obviously see the example of this if you think about balloons if you let go of a balloon at ground level, at sea level, or wherever your base of reference is, and it goes up, the balloon is going to get bigger, okay, because it's going to occupy more space, because at higher altitude, there's less atmospheric pressure compressing that gas. So the concern, the safety issue with the ET cuff is as that, as that uh, vehicle, the helicopter, goes to a higher altitude, with less pressure at altitude, that ET cuff is going to get bigger, and it's possibly going to cause some, some damage to the trachea, and we don't want that to happen. So we take the air out of the cuff, and instead we fill it with an equal volume of saline prior to transport. Liquid, the saline does not expand at altitude, okay? So that volume in the ET cuff is going to stay the same at a higher altitude. Now, let's talk a little bit more about this altitude thing, and then I'll go into why the other questions, the other answers are wrong. So the question states they're being transported by helicopter EMS, okay? Now, because it says helicopter, maybe you know, maybe you don't know, but below 10,000 feet, we do not have to have pressurization in aircraft. And most of your medical transport aircraft, your helicopters, 
are not pressurized. So that means when they're flying, and they fly about six to 8,000 feet during the transport, at that altitude, there is the gas laws in effect, and so volume of gases does expand. Now, if they're flying fixed wing, a regular airplane, a medical airplane, and not a helicopter, that would not be an issue because they'd fly above 10,000 feet and they would be pressurized to sea level, okay? So, because the question says helicopter EMS, then what I hoped to have you know or learn from this, maybe it's something that will benefit you down the road, is that helicopters are usually fly below the pressurization altitude. They fly below 10,000 feet, usually around 8,000, and hence they're unpressurized, so all those gas laws apply. And in this scenario, the ET cuff might possibly expand, depending on how high they fly. So the, the answer about C, Charlie, is the correct answer. Now, some people were kind of um, latching on to answer B, which was to change the hair traction, which we use for our mid-femur fractures, the hair traction to a rigid knee immobilizer. And you may be familiar with this, and this is a correct answer sometimes, but not all the time, okay? Why is it a correct answer sometimes? Because some of the helicopter airframes are not large enough to accommodate that hair traction that usually has that extra four to six uh, inches sticking out from the end of the patient's foot that may not fit in the patient compartment. Now, the reason this is not the right answer is because this is not true of all helicopter airframes. All right, specifically the EC-135s. Um, I know you guys may not know specific models, but the, um, the 135s, uh, some of those models are the larger ones, and you may know them because they're the ones that actually carry the stretchers on them. The actual, um, I think most of them are yellow. Uh, they've got the wheels. These are usually the helicopters that you don't have to go out to receive the patient and bring an ER stretcher because they're already on a stretcher. Those are an example of a bigger airframe that can handle these things, okay? Um, but that's just one example of the EC-135, certain models. So that's why answer B is not the best answer because it doesn't apply in every helicopter situation. However, answer uh, C is the correct answer because it does apply to every helicopter situation regardless of the airframe model. Let's look at answer A. Why is answer A wrong? <coughs> okay, so the answer uh, A says you're gonna DC the chest tube drainage unit. And your mind is probably thinking, okay, something about flying at altitude, some gases, some venting, things like that. So yeah, it sounds like a good idea. But what, what I also added on to that answer was to clamp the chest tube. When do we clamp a chest tube? Some people say never. What's the risk of clamping a chest tube? A pneumothorax developing. If we were to DC the chest seal, the chest drain, and just clamp the chest tube at altitude, the patient's, the air that's trapped in the intrapleural space can expand and actually cause an increasing pneumothorax. Okay, so that's something bad that can happen. It's okay in a helicopter to leave that chest drainage unit attached. It is vented to the outside, okay? It's not a closed system, all right? That's why you have the water seal so air can escape um, with the uh, ventilation cycle. So no, changing out the chest drainage unit and clamping the tube is not the correct answer. Why is answer D not correct? It, the answer D was to change the intraosseous to a regular peripheral IV. There's no difference in IV sites for flying at altitude. It doesn't change anything. The only thing that may be in your mind related to IVs, IVs during transport is something about the containers, the IV bags that either have the fluids or the drugs. And yes, for those IV bags, we need to get the air out or we need to DC the IV or make sure it's vented. So your standard bag of normal saline, if there's any air in it at unpressurized altitude, i.e. in a helicopter, that vo volume of air that's still in the saline bag can expand and cause and cause some issues or considerations. So, but the actual IV insertion site, intraosseous versus a peripheral IV does not need to change. Altitude does not affect that, okay? So again, the right answer is, is answer C, you deflate the ET cuff, refill it with saline, leave the chest drain unit alone, leave any pre-existing IV sites alone, and depending on if the question says what size helicopter your patient will be in, you do not necessarily need to change out the hair traction device, okay? All right, I hope this helps, guys. Uh, 
took about 10 minutes to talk through that, but maybe you learned something. Um, I don't want any of you that are doing CEN stuff to freak out about these, uh, this flight question. It's just good information to know uh, about patient transport, etc. And, you know, potentially if you, if you are transporting or transferring a patient out, you know, you, these are some things you could think about or consider before the flight crew arrives, which makes their job even easier. Because these are some of the things the flight crew is going to be assessing prior to transport. So I hope this helps. Uh, keep following the Facebook page. Um, let me know if there's any comments or questions. Um, you can add your comment below this video. Uh, like it, share it with your friends. For those of you in the air medical community that are kind of doing the CFRN or FPC thing, I hope this definitely helps you as far as refreshing some of your stuff about the flight, um, about uh, gas laws. And good luck to you. Let me know how things go. I'll talk to you guys later. Be safe. Enjoy your weekend.